Welcome to another episode of Judgment Date. We have been dealing with these programs right through the lockdown, trying to give people some knowledge, some understanding, some insight and context into the medical, the legal, and the economic implications of this unique event, once in a century event. And perhaps as we now move to lockdown level one, it's particularly appropriate to welcome back Professor Shabir Mahdi, who is the recently appointed Dean of the Faculty of Medicine at the University of Advarsrand, and has been a central player in much of this. We had him earlier on. We were grateful for that. We're very grateful again to have you. Let me just say congratulations for your appointment as Dean. And can I ask you, now that we're on level one, I mean, does that, I know you've said we can't relax our guard. And I suppose the real question that neurotics like me would have would be, why will we not go through the same um, kind of sequence that's happened almost everywhere with the second wave? So thanks, Dennis, for having me again. And I think that's a really interesting question. And in fact, the more interesting question is why is South Africa had a waning in terms of this epidemic uh, compared to the reason why the Northern Hemispheres had a waning in terms of their first wave uh, and what is happening right now in the Northern Hemisphere. So I, I think we just need to sort of uh, desegregate what happened in the Northern Hemisphere at the time of its first uh, outbreak. So the Northern Hemisphere basically went into a severe lockdown, a highly restrictive lockdown at a time when the epidemic was peaking. Unlike in South Africa, where we went into a high level of lockdown pretty much at the start of the epidemic. Now, what happened in the Northern Hemisphere is that that lockdown actually resulted in an interruption in terms of the chain of transmission of the virus. And that's the reason why the epidemic reigned in the Northern Hemisphere. Now, consequently, what happened, and you take Spain as an example of a country in the Northern Hemisphere, after the first wave, the region of Spain that was most affected by the virus was Madrid. But the percentage of the population that were actually infected in Madrid was only roughly about 11 to 12 percent. So there's still a huge percentage of the population that remains susceptible to being infected with the virus. Uh, what happened is they went into the summer period. Uh, they started to allow for nightclubs, gatherings, etc. And the virus started to recirculate. And when people came back home, coupled with a change in terms of the climatic conditions, the virus was now again able to transmit between individuals because more than 85% of the population was still highly susceptible to being infected. And that's the reason why we're seeing the second wave uh, emerging in many of the European countries the United Kingdom, France, Spain, Italy, uh, etc. In South Africa, on the other hand, as the epidemic was actually increasing with the first wave, we were actually going to a lower level of restriction rather than increasing our restriction. Uh, and inadvertently, what actually ended up happening, possibly in South Africa, is that a large percentage of the population, uh, probably up to about one third of the adult population, have possibly been infected with the virus. Now, when one third of the population is infected with the virus, coupled with people using face masks, avoiding mass gatherings, uh, and allowing for some physical distancing, even though it's not complete, there isn't 100% compliance to that. But even with that being used at a limited scale, when one third of the population is actually infected, that allows for some sort of evolution of what we call herd immunity which effectively means that's an interruption in terms of the chain of transmission of the virus. And that's the reason why South Africa's wave has probably started to go downwards uh, right now. So there's very different reasons in terms of the factors that have influenced the waning of the epidemic in South Africa uh, compared to what actually influenced the waning of the first wave in the Northern Hemisphere. Uh, but unfortunately for the Northern Hemisphere, they, they seem to have large percentage of the population that remains susceptible. So you can expect the virus in the absence of people uh, adhering or complying with the non-pharmaceutical interventions, you can expect the type of surge that should be experiencing at the moment. Why, why do you say, well, firstly, let me, uh, 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 I understand the idea of herd immunity. I almost call the herd mentality, like... Uh, <laughs> Trump, which shows how much he knows about anything. But what I want to ask, how do you come to the fact that roughly a third of the population might have been infected? 
Right. So right now, the evidence for that is tenuous, I would admit. Uh, but there are some sort of opportunistic sampling that's been done in the Western Cape and in Gauteng. That's a very small sample with regard to pregnant women, as I understand it. Right. In the Western Cape, it was pregnant women as well as people living with HIV. In yeah. Gauteng, it was basically sampling that was done of individuals that were volunteering to participate in our vaccine study in three different places, in Soweto, in the inner city in Hillbrow, as well as in Swanee. And when we started to screen individuals, when they, start, when they came to volunteer for participation in the study, there were two really striking things which we hadn't expected for all intents and purposes. Uh, we started the study at a time when Gauteng was sort of peaking. And the first thing that we realized is that when we were screening individuals that were asymptomatic volunteers, when they were coming, we were screening them by doing a nasal swab, which is looking for active infection, roughly about 20% of people, 21 out of every five of the volunteers that were completely asymptomatic were actually infected. So we couldn't actually include them in a study. But in addition to that, over a short period of time, what we also did was we looked for antibody as evidence of past infection at least two weeks earlier. And again, what we found in Soweto as an example is that 35% of volunteers in Soweto uh, were already, had already been infected by the time they actually came forward to volunteer to participate in the study. Now again, the numbers are small, uh, but this is the only biological way that we can actually explain why there's been a waning of the epidemic when you've reached the sort of herd immunity type of effect because of a large percentage of the population that have been infected. What needs but to happen now... Your, but for what example, there was a study... Is we need to sorry, carry, carry on, sorry, do yeah. more systematic sampling to verify that these observations are correct and apply are more generalizable than these settings. So we are going to get a, a, a larger study, which will give us more activity. Because can I ask you, I mean, in the New York... Uh, sorry, the New, Journal, uh, New England Journal of Medicine, they had a study from Iceland, which says that the seroprevalence, as you would probably know, is much lower than, on a fairly sophisticated study than we claiming in South Africa. Why would that be? Right. So, and this is exactly what I sort of alluded to earlier. The reason why uh, the Northern Hemisphere countries, why that first wave started to wane was not because they reached herd immunity, but rather because of the highly restrictive measures they put into place at the time of the peak of the outbreak. So that actually prevented more people from being infected at scale. And there was waning of this outbreak, there was waning of circulation of the virus simply because people went into a lockdown at the time when the epidemic was peaking in the Northern Hemisphere. So consequently, the percentage of the population that has been infected in many countries, including Iceland, is actually around about 10 to 12 percent, 10 to 15 percent much lower than the, 30, than the one third that we are postulating being the case in South Africa. So let's assume it wasn't one third, but even 25%, which would be high. Why would the, which if you take 60 million roughly people, I mean, you take the one third, that's 20 million people who may well have been affected. Why, I, I know that our death rate is definitely underestimated, everybody, owned, but let's assume it was the 35 or 40,000 deaths that, uh, that people suggest. That's still astonishingly low for such a level of, of infection. Can we, have we any basis for explaining that? Uh, exactly correct. Uh, so firstly, I don't want to get stuck on that figure of 20 million. I know I've been cited on that figure of 20 million. I, I don't care. We could call it 10, 15. Uh, should I be exactly. like, it's right. still a very and low level it, of death. Yeah. Right. And I think it's in a figure of, in a region of 12 to 15 million infections that, we, that okay. likely has occurred in South Africa. But the question that you ask is really important. Why hasn't this translated into excessive number of hospitalizations, into large number of deaths from COVID-19? So if you were to do the back of the envelope calculation, if one third of the population, of adult population has really been infected, uh, assuming a case fatality rate of, or an infection mortality, infection fatality rate, of 0.3%, which is what they observed mm. in Iceland. Right? Mm. We could have expected close on to 120,000 people to have died from COVID-19 yes. rather than 40,000. But we think 40,000. So there's something else at play, which might be contributing to infections, not translating into large number of severe cases, as well as large number of people dying from COVID-19. Now, what are the possibilities? The one possibility is that we always, there's been much mention of a younger age group demographic in Africa, including in South Africa. 
which will result in less severe disease despite higher force of infection. Uh, I don't think that's the main reason because in South Africa, as an example, that uh, sort of benefit of advantage of having a younger age group demographic is offset by a higher prevalence of diabetes, obesity, hypertension. So that wouldn't explain it. And we know that HIV and TB, fortunately for us, haven't been a major role player in terms yeah. of severe disease. Now, what else could explain this? Now, one of the things which I'm really uh, interested in and something that we're investigating currently, and there is data from high-income countries to support this notion, is that there might be some level of cross-immunity because of people previously having been exposed to the common cold coronaviruses. So these are the coronaviruses that have been circulating in humans for, since the 1960s. In Soweto, as an example, in studies that we've done in the past, we've shown that in children under the age of five, when you sample them throughout the year, one out of every five children will be infected with this common cold coronaviruses. 20% of young children will be infected oh. with these viruses. They might be transmitting these viruses to the adults, especially in these heavily densely populated areas. We know that viruses transmit much more efficiently between people. And the adults that have been infected don't get ill. That's why it's called a common cold coronavirus. It's mild symptoms, but it does induce immunity. And that immunity that's induced by the common cold coronaviruses may be inducing cross-protection against developing severe COVID-19. So it doesn't protect against infection, but it protects against the progression of the infection into severe disease. And that is a hypothesis which is most appealing to me and which we're currently uh, testing out. Well, that's very interesting. Now, I mean, just can I ask you, how long will it be before we get sort of a larger sample to support these hypotheses? The third herd immunity, the uh, fact that it may be a, 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 some form of coronavirus that is helping us. Uh, are these studies underway at the moment? So they're imminent. So both of the studies are literally, and my unit is involved in both, uh, at least in Gauteng. So in Gauteng, we'll be doing a serious survey which goes down to a sub-district level. And that's especially important because it will show us the differences as an example between Centen and Alexandra, Soweto, uh, and another more affluent surrounding area. And there's evidence from Mumbai which shows as an example that when they did a serious surveys in the slum areas, up to 50% of people in the slum areas, so-called slum areas were infected, compared to about 20% of people in the surrounding more affluent areas. And this is in Mumbai. Uh, so we're doing the serious survey in Gauteng at a sub-district level, and we should have an answer to that within two months. I'm hoping sooner. We're going to start a study in about two weeks from now. Uh, in terms of okay. the other study looking at cross-protective immunity, uh, those are collaborations that we have set up now, uh, and we should hopefully get those studies completed within a month as well. So let's just assume that you're right, that your studies reflect that a third of the population was infected 25 to 30 percent or whatever it is, 12 million or whatever it may be, that still indicates that there are a huge percentage of the population who not, haven't been infected. So whilst we may not get quite the prevalence of the second wave, logic would tell me that a second wave is still likely even if it's less acute. Would, would that be... Uh, would yeah. on, the, on the spot, without any question. I think we're going to get a resurgence in South Africa. And so the type of herd immunity I'm referring to right now is in the context of the use of non-pharmaceutical interventions. The percentage of the population that you require to be infected for that to evolve is very different compared to the percentage of the population that needs to be infected in the absence of these non-pharmaceutical interventions. So in the absence of the non-pharmaceutical interventions, you need two-thirds of the population to be infected and way, way below that. So what we're likely to see in South Africa is that over the December period, as an example, people are probably going to become more complacent about the use of non-pharmaceutical interventions. There's going to be gatherings in families, in churches, whatever else it is. That is going to sort of allow for a fertile ground for increased circulation of the virus. We're then going to probably get a resurgence of probably around about February or so. Uh, that would be my estimate. But we certainly will get a resurgence. And what happens but then? Like sure. Yeah. Yeah, carry on. Sorry, carry on. Like it, when we do get such a resurgence, it will be less severe than what we experienced this time around. So that would mean that we wouldn't have to do what the Brits are having to think about now, which is a, a permanent lockdown as a circuit breaker. But it would mean, I presume, some tougher 
measures yet again of some sort. Exactly. And I think, uh, I mean, I don't think there's much uh, opportunity and scope for South Africa ever to return to a level five lockdown in terms of the impact yeah. it's had on livelihoods, on the economy. But I think we could, simply, we, we could get away with enforcement of uh, people needing to adhere to these non-pharmaceutical interventions. I don't think we, one of the things that's been done recently is the allowing of mass gatherings or increasing the, allowing an increased number of people to gather in churches, in mosques, et cetera. I don't think that's the way to go. Uh, I think, unfortunately, those sort of gatherings lends itself to what we call super spreader events, which is going to accelerate the transmission of the virus. So we're going to need to adhere to the wearing of face masks, physical distancing, et cetera, for a longer period of time. And ideally, we probably should be rolling back on allowing those sort of mass gatherings. So could I ask you would, you, would you say that, in fact, even the extension to 250 people is a bit of a reach, a bit of a risk? It, it is. It's a risk. And I think that was demonstrated in a number of events in the United States as an example where people got together in churches, in choirs. Uh, you've had one case responsible for 40, 50 other cases in an immediate environment, and those go out in the community and infect other susceptible individuals. So allowing for those mass gatherings, unfortunately, lends itself to super spreader events, where many people get infected over a short period of time. Isn't the opening of pubs, I mean, uh, maybe I'm wrong, but I mean, it seemed to be, is that not a risk? It is. Restaurants have actually been shown to increase your risk of developing yes. COVID-19 at least twofold. Pubs would even be worse because we know what happens in a pub. Uh, and especially when there's lots of people in that pubs. And that's the reason why the UK are rolling back on the opening of pubs, restaurants. Uh, but that is so, the reality. So let me ask you this then. I mean, um, we're obviously, are, you know, I suppose the irony about South Africa is everybody thought, maybe it's not an irony, is everybody thought that our medical infrastructure would collapse and uh, we'd do worse than many other countries. Actually, we've done much better. I mean, I don't think there's any doubt about it. And you don't have to be particular supporters of any political party to say government and the advice that people like ourselves have given have been get done remarkably well. Economically is another matter. But what I'm asking is, given that economic, there's obviously a temptation, has to be, to incentive that tourism opens up to a greater extent. Are you worried that, that as we move into a situation whereby we start getting international tourists, that that poses a big risk to us? Or is it not such a big risk? Actually, in a South African context, it's not a big risk. Uh, so it's a big risk for countries that have been trying to contain the spread of the virus. As an example, New Zealand, Iceland, uh, Australia, South Korea. For those sort of countries where there's very low population immunity, that type of opening of the borders poses a huge risk. In a South African context, if we are correct that one third of the adult population has been infected, and knowing that we are at a different stage of the epidemic, uh, we don't, we're not aspiring to containment of the virus, the virus is transmitting, there's very little risk, in fact, to allow foreigners to come into the country, even without the test, to be honest, provided that the foreigners that come into the country do what is being recommended of South Africans, and that is wear face masks in public spaces, avoid overcrowded situations. So there actually is very little risk allowing foreigners to come into the country. If there is a resurgence in South Africa, it's not going to be because of the foreigners coming into the country with a virus. It's going to be, again, because of the behavior of South Africans, which is going to allow for the virus to start uh, spreading again. That does worry me. I mean, um, I think there's a strange dichotomy. I mean, maybe I'm incredibly wrong, but I notice that the people in townships and others are pretty fastidious about wearing masks. I have to say, Middle class people, and let me not get myself into trouble by saying which kind of middle class people. But I, every time I walk along the Seapoint beachfront, I'm amazed by all these middle class people running and walking without masks and without a care in the world. I mean, that's got to be dangerous. No, so Dennis, and actually not. Uh, if you're in a good ventilated area and open spaces are ventilated okay. areas, and if you're not spending more than five, 10 minutes, speaking to someone, if they're just passing you by, there's very little reason for them to actually wear a mask. Okay. Uh, the runner, the cycler, the walker is not posing any risk to anyone, provided that they're not in close proximity for a prolonged period of time, for more than 10 to 15 minutes. So I don't think that's a, I think it's really when you're going into this sort of uh, poorly ventilated areas, including possibly shopping malls, that's when the risk really increases.
But when people get into restaurants, Shabir, I mean, um, and many of the restaurants with respect are not adhering to the guidelines that you people have suggested. People, firstly, I was amazed the other day going for breakfast with somebody, whereas two weeks earlier, there'd be nobody in the restaurant. Suddenly it was full. And, you know, obviously people have to eat, they take their masks off. And I mean, surely that's a bit of a hot house. I mean, one way or the other. It is, without a question. And I mean, my only recommendation is that if restaurants want to open, they need to move outdoors. The seating needs to be outdoors. that's much easier in the summer. In the summer, we'll be able to... In the summer, yeah. yeah. But other than that, unfortunately, I agree with you, especially when we see crowds of 10, 15 people around the table. Uh, that, unfortunately, is going to lend itself to increased risk of infection. And those very same people are the ones that probably have got a lower level of immunity to start off with right now at a population level because they're coming from more affluent areas, they're probably less likely to have been infected the first time around. So unfortunately, that does pose a material risk. So now let me move on, because you're inv heavily involved with the vaccine. Last time we spoke a little bit about it, but I, I'd like to spend the last few minutes with you talking about that. I mean, what is your prognosis now with regard to the vaccine in general and South Africa in particular? So I think by the end of this year, we probably will have at least one or two vaccine studies that uh, come to fruition and are able to answer the question as to whether the vaccine is safe and whether it's efficacious. Uh, we probably will get to that point by the end of this year because of what's happening currently in the Northern Hemisphere, there's an upsurge in terms of number of cases. So those vaccine studies are much more suited to be able to provide an answer earlier than later. Uh, but that is just the start of the road in terms of availability and access to the vaccine. Uh, after that, it's about starting to manufacture hundreds of millions of doses of vaccine and then the distribution of the vaccine, both in terms of access as well as in terms of equity. And those are huge challenges. So right now, as an example, the United States, Russia and China seem to be going it alone. Fortunately, I've read that the United Kingdom, many of the other European countries have bought into this a uh, concept known as a COVAX facility, which is trying to get the more equitable yeah. distribution of vaccine. So I think that's good that some of the high income countries are coming into this fold. Uh, so I don't think uh, in the first uh, quarter of next year, we probably will have some vaccine become available, but it will be very targeted to individuals that are high risk of developing severe disease, as well as probably frontline healthcare workers. Uh, it is very unlikely that the general population, even in the United States, would be able to access vaccine uh, before the middle of next year. Now, in South Africa, hopefully, and I think South Africa has also signed up to the COVAX facility, which really is our best hope of being able to get vaccine, at least for some percentage of our population at an early stage. Uh, but in terms of vaccine studies in South Africa, we, because of the waning of the outbreak in South Africa, it's unlikely that we will now be able to get an answer during the course of this year as to whether these vaccines work in South Africa or not. It will probably take us longer because the nature of the studies is that some people have to get infected with the virus to develop COVID-19 before we can do an analysis to determine whether the vaccine protects against COVID-19 or not. So I think we probably will need to wait for a resurgence before we would be able to address that question, at least in South Africa. And then how long, will, well, let me ask you two questions. One, um, why would there be, I mean, this is obviously uh, for people like myself, we really don't know about the subject, so it's born of ignorance. Is there a difference between, let us say, a vaccine that passes through all the trials and is efficacious in Britain or America or wherever it is, uh, if the Oxford study in England, uh, which I understand we may be part of, um, if they say it's fine for the Brits, why would that not be fine for us? No, it would be. Uh, a vaccine that's shown to be efficacious anywhere, uh, there's, okay. uh, good, there's good enough reason for it to be introduced. So if effect. they find that it's efficacious there, let us say, will we still have to wait uh, a longer period here or could we then start manufacturing? Will we be able to manufacture here? No, well, we don't have manufacturing capacity on our entire ah. African continent, let alone South Africa. So we're highly dependent on external manufacturers. And the Serum Institute of India has got a grant from the Gates Foundation to manufacture vaccines, specifically for the COVAX facility and for low middle income countries. And that's probably where we'll end up getting the initial uh, doses of vaccine. Uh, but if the vaccine is shown to be efficacious in any country, it would be adequate 
adequate to support its use throughout the world, although there so might be differences between settings in terms of how well it works. So if, for example, um, let's assume taking your time to the end of this year, early next year, um, the vaccine is, is efficacious. My understanding is that India is an unbelievable place for actually manufacturing these things. Um, how long would it be before, at the very least, and I'm not holding you to it, but I'm just it's indicative, that let's say the frontline workers and the people who really are vulnerable in South Africa would be able to get access to vaccine? Will we be talking about the middle of next year or, or, or later? Yeah. No, I think it will be the second quarter of next year that there would be some possibility of us getting at least a couple of million doses of vaccine. But again, it will be for high-risk groups, healthcare workers, and probably individuals at high risk of severe disease. And I wonder if I can ask you, in relation to the vaccine, I mean, obviously, if it works uh, and if it's proved to be efficacious, um, what will that mean for our lives going forward? I mean, how normal will we look? I mean, yeah, will you and I still be talking on Zoom alone or will, we, will I be able to buy you a cup of tea or a beer or something in, in Johannesburg and so with feeling that I can travel quite happily because I've been vaccinated? So that is the, the big, the, there's two parts to that answer. The first part is whether the vaccine actually protects against upper airway infection. And it's really important for a vaccine, not just to protect against severe disease, but also against upper airway infection, because that's how you're able to get an interruption in terms of the chain of transmission of the virus. And then a big issue is that you need to get at least two thirds of the population develop immunity, either through vaccination or through natural infection, provided that both have durable immunity or provide durable immunity. So it's not, like I said, it's unlikely we're going to get more than 20 million doses of vaccine as a first pass. Whereas if we've got the adult population of 40 million, we probably need to get uh, roughly about 60 to 80 million doses of vaccine because many of these vaccines you need to give two doses. Two doses. So I don't think the prospects are too bright for us to be able to return to normal uh, probably until next year this time. And next year this time, if we've got a but can I just ask you this? I mean, if you write about the fact that a third of the population have herd immunity, then, then one, would we know who they were? In other words, in order to ensure that they didn't have to get the vaccine as quickly as people who, who don't have the immunity, would we, would we have knowledge of that? Well, that's another big question that's unknown in terms of the durability of immunity following natural oh. infection. So that right. is a big unknown question. And we're doing those sort of studies. So next year, this time, we'll know people that were infected one year ago, how many of them have persistence of immunity one year later. But from a programmatic perspective, it's not feasible for us to be testing people to see if they previously had been infected or not to decide who gets the vaccine. Uh, programmatically, just the logistics of it won't make that sort of a program workable. So the approach would be to vaccinate irrespective of whether the people have been previously infected, are seropositive or seronegative. So can I just ask you, are you worried, Shabir, about the fact of someone like um, Trump politicizing it and therefore pushing out a vaccine that isn't efficacious simply because he wants to persuade his own population that in fact he's doing a great job and of course he isn't? Yeah, so I think all of the major companies are pretty much uh, singing from the same hymn sheet in that no one is going to be rushed in terms of providing an answer and the science of it doesn't allow for you to do that. So it's extremely unlikely that any of the manufacturers will have a vaccine by the 3rd of November that has gone through scientific uh, testing. So unfortunately, I don't think that's on the table. I would be highly surprised if any of the companies are knowing where they are with their vaccine development and where they are in terms of the clinical trials, it's almost impossible for them to be able to provide an answer within the next two months. So what you're saying is they'd be absolutely irresponsible if they just bowed to Trump and pushed out some, yeah. some nonsense that wasn't a proper vaccine at that point. Yeah, and I think whoever recommends such a vaccine, any of the regulatory authorities will lose all credibility if they try to do such a rush job about it. So one final question for you. So what in the light of all this, it gives you the most anxiety as we move forward? Well, I'm actually highly optimistic in the South African context. Uh, I think we're really in a good space. Uh, if one third of the population have really been infected, uh, I think we're in a good space in terms of the next, there is probably going to be a resurgence, but it's going to be less severe than this time around. So in South Africa, I really believe that we've actually weathered the storm reasonably well. 
Uh, and it's not just about the government, it's also about something that we haven't been able to explain at the end of the day. Something has worked in our favor. Uh, and like I said, my thinking is that this is cross protection because of exposure to common coronaviruses, but there's something which has fortunately assisted us through the storm. So I'm actually losing less sleep now than I was six weeks ago. Yeah, you look much better than you did when I last interviewed you. But let me say thank you, because the truth about it is the country needs, the country needs a bit of optimism. And, um, you know, it's thanks to you and uh, uh, Professor Karim, Professor Gray and others have done a remarkable job in assisting the government. We're really indebted to you. And thank you very much for coming on. I, I almost want to say that I hope I don't have to interview you again, although I suspect <laughs> So thank you very much. Thank you very much. <laughs>